Khalid ibn al-Walid, born in 584 and died in 642. Alexander was a great military commander. Genghis Khan was an immensely successful warrior and Napoleon was a gifted strategist. However, only one military general possessed all of these qualities in the history of warfare and that man was Khalid ibn al-Walid, the thunder from Arabia. He was an incomparable military genius who single-handedly humbled two of the greatest empires of his time. A man of few words, Khalid allowed his unsurpassed achievements in the battlefield speak for themselves. As he burst out of Arabia, his name spread like wildfire, and Khalid's opponents feared no other man more than him. The son of Al-Walid was a natural-born talent, a military genius who read his adversaries' weaknesses like the writing on the wall and was able to inspire his men to victory even from the jaws of defeat. Khalid's astounding feats and unprecedented successes on the battlefield have found their way into Muslim folklore. Even today, children throughout the Muslim world grow up listening to his heroic feats. Khalid ibn al-Walid was born into the respected Qurayshi tribe of Mecca. He was around 24 when Muhammad received his first revelation. Khalid's father, Walid ibn al-Mughira was a highly respected individual who was considered to be one of the wisest and most clever men of his generation. Like the father, the son grew up to be a highly accomplished young man, imbued with a natural talent and physical vitality. Khalid acquired a keen interest in the art of warfare from a young age. He became proficient in war strategies, tactics and planning even when he was in his teens. By the age of 20, he acquired considerable reputation among his people for his expertise in archery, lancing and horse riding skills. In other words, he was a very quick, physically strong and agile young man. After the Prophet migrated the Hijrah from Mecca to Medina in 622, his Meccan foes became alarmed when they heard that he and his followers had not only won over the people of Medina to the new faith, but that they had also managed to unify the people of Medina on the basis of equality, fraternity, brotherhood and sisterhood, as envisaged by Islam. The Prophet's successes frightened the Meccans more than anything else. So they resolved to take direct action against the nascent Muslim community. When a large Meccan army set out to obliterate the Muslims, the Prophet and his followers met the advancing Meccan army at Badr, and inflicted a crushing defeat on them. The resounding victory was later dramatically reversed when the Meccans determined to avenge their previous defeat, launched a fresh attack against the Muslims in 625. Thanks largely to the ingenious Khalid, the Muslims suffered heavy casualties in the battle. The 41-year-old Khalid's last-minute intervention totally reversed the outcome of the battle in favour of the Meccans. For the first time in his life, Khalid made a crucial intervention in a battle and changed his outcome in favour of the Meccan army. This was to mark the beginning of an astonishing military career unparalleled in the history of warfare. In 630, during the eighth year of the Prophet's migration to Medina, the 46-year-old Khalid received a letter from his brother Al-Walid ibn Walid, who had already embraced Islam. The letter read, in the name of God, the most merciful, the most compassionate. I have not seen anything more surprising than you keeping away from Islam, although you're a man of wisdom. No one of your calibre should remain ignorant of Islam. The messenger of God also asked me, Where's Khalid? he remarked. How is a man like Khalid ignorant of Islam? It'd be good for him if he devoted his capabilities for the cause of the Muslims. We would have preferred him to the others. Oh brother, compensate now for the mistake that has been committed in the battles against Islam. This letter shook Khalid to his core and suddenly a ray of Islam began to shine all over his being. Along with Amr ibn al-As, another brilliant Muslim general, Khalid left Mecca for Medina and presented himself before the Prophet. O oh, messenger of God, cried Khalid, I remember all the scenes of fighting with you and my animosity with the truth. Please pray to God to forgive me. 
Islam wipes out all the wrongs that are committed before embracing it, retorted the Prophet. On another occasion, the Prophet remarked, The better ones of you in the days of ignorance are the better ones of you in Islam. When they understand the faith, that is. The Prophet's words summed up Khalid's qualities as a new Muslim. Prior to his acceptance of Islam, he was a persistent thorn on the side of the Prophet and his companions. But after embracing Islam, he became an almighty hammer, which helped crush Islam's opponents. The very mention of his name was enough to send shivers down his enemy's spine. Given Khalid's ability as a soldier and military tactician, the Prophet asked him to accompany the Muslim army and face the subversive Byzantines, who had camped along the northern borders of Arabia. Led by three distinguished military commanders, Khalid was only too happy to accompany the army onto the battlefield as an ordinary soldier. As it happens, only 3,000 Muslims fought more than 50,000 well-equipped and highly trained Byzantine soldiers. In the ensuing battle, all three Muslim commanders fell one after the other. As the tide of the battle began to turn against the Muslims, Khalid assumed leadership of the Muslim army and saved the day. Hitherto, the Muslims were fighting a losing battle, but now, in the middle of a raging conflict, Khalid managed to revitalise the Muslim fortunes by launching a rear attack. It gave the impression to the Byzantines that fresh reinforcements had arrived for the Muslims. In reality, Khalid had merely withdrawn some of his forces from the battlefield and instructed them to attack from the rear to divert enemies' attention. This stroke of genius by Khalid enabled the Muslim army to create a buffer zone between themselves and their enemies. The Prophet received the news of the death of the three Muslim commanders by divine inspiration, Wahi, and remarked, Then the sword of God took hold of the banner and saved the day. This was in reference to Khalid's heroic feats on the battlefield. From that day onwards, Khalid became known as Saifullah, or the sword of God. After the death of the Prophet in 632, numerous dissident groups led by a number of opportunists and impostors emerged to create mischief across Arabia. Khalifa Abu Bakr, the Prophet's successor, was determined to teach these miscreants a lesson or two. Khalid played a pivotal role in putting an end to all such subversive activities in the Arabian Peninsula, and in doing so, he became a saviour of Islam in one of Islamic history's most critical periods. With great foresight and profound understanding of Khalid's unusual military abilities, Khalifa Abu Bakr sent him to face the battle-hardened Persian army in 633. The Persians saw the rise of Islam in the neighbouring Arabia as a threat to their interests and they began to instigate subversive activities against this new faith. Not willing to tolerate Persian interference in the affairs of Muslims, Khalifa Abu Bakr summoned Khalid and told him to go and teach the Persians a good lesson in warfare. He marched out of Arabia and came in direct contact with the Persian army. He then wrote a letter to Hurmuz, the famous Persian military general, in which he spelled out his objective. He writes, Our aim is not to fight you. Accept Islam in a peaceful way, and you'll be safe. If not, then clear our way to the people so that they may explain this beautiful way of life to them. If you don't accept any of these conditions, then the only alternative I have is to use a sword. Before deciding on the third alternative, you should keep in mind that I'm bringing against you a people who love death more than you love your life. Hurmuz dismissed Khalid's letter and challenged him to a fight one-to-one. -one. Khalid accepted the challenge and put the most famous Persian general to the sword before he could even make a move. His frightening speed and awesome display of military skills left everyone spellbound. A fierce battle then ensued. A poorly equipped and irregular Muslim army led by a truly incomparable military genius inflicted a crushing defeat on one of the greatest empires in history. Not surprisingly, the historians consider Khalid's victory over the Persians to be one of his greatest achievements. In total, Khalid fought 15 battles against the Persians and on each and every one of them, he brought them to their knees. The Persian feared Khalid more than anyone else. After subduing the Persians, Khalid turned his attention 
to the infiltrative activities of the Byzantine army. They too feared the growing power of the Muslim world and indirectly encouraged the neighbouring states to rise up against the Muslims. Khalifa Abu Bakr resolved to deal with the looming dangers presented by the Byzantines. He created four different battalions, each led by a separate military commander. Under the command of Abu Ubaidah ibn al-Jarar, Amir ibn al-As, Yazid ibn Abu Sufyan, and Shurabil ibn Hasana, the four battalions set out in different directions to face the Byzantines. Since the Byzantines had dispatched a very large army to crush the Muslims, the Khalif ordered Khalid to leave his Persian garrison and join the army he had sent to face the Byzantines. In July 634, Khalid met up with the Muslim army at Ajnadain. He held a council of all the Muslim commanders and suggested that one of them should take overall command of the army. The Muslim army consisted of 45,000 men, while the Byzantines army consisted of around 150,000 troops. The decisive battle of Yarmouk was now looming on the horizon. Like the Persians, the Byzantines were also fascinated by the genius of Khalid. They were very keen to see the man Muslim fondly referred to as a sword of God. After due deliberation, the Muslim army, under the central command of Khalid, met the well-equipped, professionally trained and highly motivated soldiers of the Byzantine Empire. An affairs battle then ensued. During the battle, Khalid received a letter from Medina informing him of the death of Khalif Abu Bakr. The letter, signed by Khalif Umar, instructed Khalid to hand over the central command of the Muslim army to Abu Ubaidah ibn al-Jarar. Khalid decided not to disclose the contents of the letter while the battle was raging, in order to avoid creating confusion among the Muslims. This was a clever move by Khalid, as it ensured the Muslim army did not lose heart at the news of the Khalif's death. Under Khalid's able leadership, 45,000 Muslims crushed a mighty Byzantine force. After the battle, Khalid informed the Muslim army of the death of the Khalif Abu Bakr and willingly placed himself under the command of Abu Ubaidah ibn al-Jarar as per Khalif Umar's instructions. To Khalid, the great military genius, it did not matter who was in charge. What mattered more than anything else was that Islam gained victory over its adversaries. He lived an, a very simple, pious and austere life dedicated to the service of Islam and the Muslims. Referring to Khalid, Khalif Abu Bakr once remarked, Oh Quraysh, verily your lion, the lion of Islam, had leapt upon the lion of Persia and spoiled him of his prey. Women shall not bear a second Khalif. As a military general, Khalid thrived in the lion's den. In the history of warfare, no other military general has achieved as much as Khalid did. In such a short period of time, although Khalid became a Muslim only a few years before the conquest of Mecca in 630, he became one of the greatest champions of Islam immediately upon embracing the new faith. His firm commitment, selfless dedication and great sacrifices for the sake of Islam made it a symbol of pride and joy for all Muslims. Considered by the Muslim soldiers to be a great gift and a blessing from God, his unprecedented success on the battlefield convinced many Muslims that as long as Khalid was with them, they would not lose a battle. The perception of Khalid's invincibility among Muslim soldiers clearly disturbed Khalif Umar, who immediately discharged him from his duties as commander of the Muslim army in order to remind the Muslims that it was God who granted victory. Moreover, Khalid would not have been able to defeat the Persians and the Byzantines, argued Umar, had it not been for divine support and assistance. The Khalif Umar did not demote Khalid out of jealousy or personal grudge, unlike suggestions by some historians. On the contrary, he was very fond of Khalid and considered him to be one of Islam's greatest sons. Khalid died of prolonged illness at the age of 58 and was buried at Hims in Syria. His desire to attain martyrdom was not realised. However, he understood why he could not die fighting in the battlefield because that would have meant defeat for the sword of God. When the news of Khalid's death was relayed to Khalif Umar, 
he remarked, the death of Khalid has created a void in Islam that cannot be filled. That was the greatness of the man who single-handedly humbled two of history's greatest empires.